Japanese soldiers were soldiers. When they were yelled at to charge, they would charge straight towards us, which you can imagine used an awful lot of ammunition. You are about to embark upon the Great Crusade to meet this mounting aggression. And make no mistake about it, good will prevail. I was born and raised in Coleman County, Alabama, a little coal mining community just five, six miles west of Huntsville called Stouts Mountain. My parents were immigrants to this country. My mother, Scotland, my father, Ireland. They met in Stouts Mountain, were married, raised 12 children. Of those 12 children, nine of us served in the Army during World War II. I became 21 years old in 1942. You better be in the Army. So I did join the Army. I first chose, I wanted to go to the Army Air Corps and become a fighter pilot cadet. But I didn't make it there, but they did send me over for uh, basic training to Camp Wheeler, Georgia, over at Macon, Georgia. Now my basic training supervisor was the, the lieutenant in charge of that section there was a lieutenant Mike Lo named Mike Logan. Okay, after having served my military training there, I did, through the rest of 1942, I did training elsewhere. Um, training over. 1943, January, I was shipped to Shenango, Pennsylvania, a deportation station, getting you ready to go overseas. There in Shenango, Pennsylvania, I was issued summer clothes. Summer clothes in Shenango, Pennsylvania was not the thing to have. But anyway, I was loaded on a train shipped to California, San Francisco, loaded on a boat, shipped to New Caledonia. Then a little while in New Caledonia, loaded again, and then to Guadalcanal. Guadalcanal, I joined the 25th Infantry Division, 35th Regiment, F Company. From there I stayed till everything was pretty well secure. Still in combat. From that point on, was, after we was made to uh, train to do a beachhead on another island, which is a little island north of Guadalcanal, uh, Vela La Vela. F Company made this beachhead, secured till they built another air court for us there. Just before when we went into Vela Vela, again, Lieutenant Mike Logan had wound up being my platoon leader. Some eight months later from my basic training, I meet Lieutenant Mac Logan again. After having been on Vela Vela a while, this guy came through wanting volunteers to go to another theater of operation in that very hazardous mission, explained to us thoroughly that they expected a 85% casualty rate and it would possibly be a three to six weeks mission with an 85% casualty. Uh, this was Colonel McGee who was giving us all this information. Uh, I and four of my companions from F Company did volunteer. The captain called us in to, to ship it when after we had volunteered. He put Mike Logan on the phone on the plane and flew him back to Guadalcanal. The other four of us caught an old LCT and it was just a CBs on the operating that. So the four of us had to mount the guns on that and it taken us the rest of that day and overnight to get back to Guadalcanal, again on Guadalcanal, where we sat and waited till all the rest of the volunteers 
from the Pacific could gather there for to be shipped. And after a few weeks there, uh, they loaded all of the volunteers on this ship, another ship, Navy ship again, and brought us back to New Caledonia. In New Caledonia, the so-called combat veterans, that's the boys, people that had been in combat in the Pacific. There was a thousand of us combat volunteers, and there was 2,000 back in the States at San Francisco loading on the ship that we had set on wait to New Caledonia till that ship got through to New Caledonia, which then we, combat veterans, uh, loaded on the ship with them and went out to India. The training in India, as we started out, first training was under, was under General Winrich, which was a British trainer, and he was training us British combat. General Wingate had already had a unit of long-range penetration into Burma, and he knew the system it was going to be, which he started out training us. Wingate flew his own little player from one unit to the other player to the other player, and he wound up crashing it. So Wingate is out. Then Frank Burroughs became our commander. January of 44, they put us on trains and brought us up to Lido, India. We marched out of Lido, India, got on the Lido Road, marched for four or five days, then we hit the jungles. Um, left the road, went into the jungles, up in the mountains around, on our way to Wallabone. Our first mission was supposed to be Wallabone, which was some 125 miles deep behind the British fighting lines back, back in Virginia. We were, our mission was to stop the supply lines into the, where they were fighting the British. On our route down to Wallaboom, we, we ran, ran into, oh, every, every day we'd run into outposts which was called minor engagements, but they were still being shot at. It was the same difference. Now, on the last um, probably three or four miles before Wallaboom, my platoon, the first platoon, had to break through the elephant grass. Elephant's grass was a real heavy grass. There was no way of breaking down. We first thought that uh, we'd just chop our way through it, but that was not working. It was too slow. So we wound up, <clears throat> we're going to take two pairs, four of us, and take our rifles, hold them as high as we could, run at that grass, jump as high as we could, and ride it down. Roll out of the way, four more would come behind it, jump into the grass, ride it down, Weighed in, and as it kept going that way, so we got through that couple of miles, or whatever, whatever the distance was, till we could hear the Japanese talking on the other side. So we stopped. We did have a police on, um, officer with us, Jerry here, he you know, we got him up there to find out what the Japanese were saying, and we understood what they were saying. They thought that we were elephants in the grass. So they were totally surprised the next morning when that was not elephants that hit them. We hit them from the, we had managed to slip out around them and get into the forest, out of the grass, before daybreak. Our, our platoon was to hold until we heard the major platoon strike the road north of us another couple of miles up. When we heard the fire in there, we broke through, go down, we went, Taken a bridge, destroyed it, found this right bank, destroyed it, and we held there till the British came in. I carried a Brown and automatic all the time I was in combat. I liked the Brown and automatic. And the, the Brown and automatic was a, carried a 20 round clip, 
it would fire at the rate of 600 rounds a minute. You could not fire that rate of 20 rounds right after full, full speed 20 rounds out. It would overheat and lock. So the idea was to shoot in bursts. I could fire the I could fire the Browning automatic in a three three shot burst, which made it ideal. I could fire three shots. I could aim. I could fire three more shots, and keep my Browning automatic still working good. After Wallaboom, Wallaboom was a really quite a surprise to a uh, disappointment to a lot of us. Uh, the, especially the ones that came out of the Pacific, we were told three to six weeks mission. Well, that was seven weeks when we left Wallaboom, where we had finished. And I don't know, wishful thinking, we were, I think, hoping that we were, were through. But no, we moved back to the rendezvous. We rested for quite a length of time, resupplied and all. And then it was decided, and since we had did such a good job at Wallaboom, that another 112 miles down the middle of the road and the supply route coming in, that there was another town, Ingong. Another Ingong that we could do the same thing with. And so we left our rendezvous, we spread again, and went on our march headed to Ingkong. It was jungle, it was jungle fighting all the way, and we just about had to cut our ways to get to Ingkong. When we got to Ingkong, there was actually even a railroad came into Ingkong from Rangoon and from China furnishing the Japanese supplies. That's why that was such an important place for us to hit. And so after a certain length of time, we did that. I can't remember, but I do remember getting to Ingkong. I remember finding the railroad. And my platoon, the platoon, hit the railroad from three or four miles, I want to say, east of Ingkong, which we managed to get back into Ingkong and establish our route. And we destroyed the railroads and the supply lines there, and also held in Kong until the British and the Chinese made it there. It was recorded that the Japanese charged, Banjo charged 17 times in one 80 period. Now, Banjo charge was anywhere from 25 soldiers to maybe 150 or 200 soldiers just run full stage, right across open space that we had established, headed full speed in the open, right towards us, into the, our automatic weapons. Japanese soldiers were soldiers. They taken orders. When they were yelled at to charge, they would charge straight towards us. And it was told to Ingkong, I don't know how accurate that could have been that they charged us 16 times in the one day time, which you can imagine used an awful lot of ammunition. We went back. Up in my area, went back up on the mountain in a pretty good sized little community of natives, native community. Grass huts, grass huts. We stayed there for quite a while. Got rested up, got resupplied, and got all the from well. And they decided again that we needed to go to Shadowzak, which was another town on closer in Mishinaw, just on the other side of the mountain from Mishinaw. That we needed to go to Shadowzak and do the same thing again which we did, we did do. And again, in a normal attack, breaking up into small groups and getting back down in to the road and the railroads. And there was a water 
line there. Railroad steel company and the Japanese being well supplied from railroad line. We went down into Shadow Lake. Um, at Shadow Lake, um, I'm assuming the Japanese were more expecting us. We went in harder, stronger fighting and was losing an awful lot of our people there. We did, did block the road, get it blocked. The Chinese come in from another direction. I don't know from where they came from, but from another direction and taken over there along with the British. And we were all but trapped. Back when we left Zadazak, we could see the Japanese almost had us. We went up a river, or my platoon went up a river. Just a small river. It is told, I did not count them, that we crossed that river 29, 49 times before we got to the end of the, where we could go up the mountains. And now that's the then river was coming out of the mountains and it was hitting one side and the other. We were having to cross from one side to the other to get to the river place. We got up the end of the river. We had to climb the mountain, which was a good eight hour hard climb. But the Japanese was at that time shelling the tail ahead of us. They were about to trap us again. We got up to the top to a pretty well traveled trade back to Nipunga, which was nine miles from where we hit the tail. Now the Japanese was approaching us very rapidly and they had artillery already set up with firing on us. So we had to make this nine miles back to Mapunga. We got back to Mapunga. My platoon sat up on the south perimeter along the road. The rest of them circled and set up a reservoir around Mapunga. We managed to stop their advance. Their artillery was still firing very heavy. And the, we're in the little town of the Punga, a little village, was open territory, and that's where the mules and the supplies were. When the artillery landing there was killing most of our animals, and a lot of our people, which we had led animals there. After about three days, the Japanese had managed to totally insert us and trap us. So in the south perimeter where I was sitting with my Browning automatic was the only automatic weapon on that south point. Now I had my, my friend of mine was a few foxholes down. He had another Browning automatic and we were manning the south program. That went on for, I counted 15 days, I think they said 13. That we were surrounded there. Each morning, they would fire, the Japanese would fire some 25 rounds of um, artillery rounds on us. Then they would fire mortar rounds and then pull a, a minor bandit charge on that south perimeter. We managed to hold them. And three times a day they would fire that ammunition and for the artillery. Then they would fire the mortars and then try to charge again on us. We managed to hold them that for that 13 days. Now on the 13th day, which wound up to be Easter Sunday, 1944, the 3rd Battalion managed to break through on the north perimeter into a, when they got through and the north, whooped the north platoon, whooped the Japanese on the north perimeter and broke through, the Japanese withdrew. I understand and found out later that the Chinese were approaching from the south side to get to us. So on Easter Sunday, 1944, 
And that morning, along about 10 o'clock, here comes the C-47 is in with another drop. This drop was the old, which we call guinea sacks, full of fried chicken. They dropped fried chicken. We had fried chicken for Easter Sunday morning, just sacks full of it. After we come off of come up, come up, now the general still well, and the other officers there found that there was some 200 of us left. That was about, that was 200 total of the three battalions able to walk and fight. As uh, it was put, he was able to stand, and if we was able to stand, we was able to carry a rifle. So they decided that we would walk across the mountains to get this, to get the mission out. And I cannot remember how long it taken us to get across that mountain. But that mountain was so steep that we had to dig steps in the mountain to let the mules step in to carry our supplies up. And then, in fact, we lost several of our mules supplying all off of the trip up. It was several days, and we lost, and then we lost men. They could not make it all the way. They just passed out and left. We managed to get into to close to the airport. Could you know that? was a fairly good landing strip. The Japanese were still using it as, with fighter planes. Not many because our fighter planes had taken over well. And after we had managed to get down the mountain, get established, get in, we came in from the, I would say the west side of the airport. Uh, at that point, there were some 80 of us left. We charged the airport. The few Japanese that were there did not put up a great fight, even though they did have, around the outer edge, they did have machine guns set up. But for some reason, they did not put up a, we would fight, but there were some 80 of us left then when we charged that airport. And most of us at that point thought it was, well, in fact, I heard soldiers swearing at the Japanese because they did not fight to get it over with. There were very few of us left then. But we stayed at the airport, maintained the airport, for quite a while later. And from that point on, a long time in November, I was handed a stack of traveling orders, still in the Clothes still hadn't shaved in two years, and that had a curl. to your travel orders. You go home. Number one, number one priority: air, rail, or water. Take your choice to go home. Of course, I take an air. Headed home. I think it taken me some three weeks to get home. I wound up the mountain in Miami. As of this date, the 5307th Provisional Unit Composite does not exist, has not existed, and will never be known of. As of now, there is no longer a 5307th Composite Unit Committee. There will be no Citations, there'll be no promotions 
since there is no unit to be promoted. So from that point on, we belonged, for two of us left, belonged to no one.